Pre-order your very own Antude-themed Switch Pro controller over at antudecontroller.com. Pre-orders end January 31st. 2023 is obviously going to go down as one of the greatest years ever when it comes to game releases. There are just so, so many high quality games, and for the entire year, it felt like they were never stopping. Zelda, Spider-Man, Baldur's Gate, Mario, Resident Evil 4, Pikmin 4, Dead Space. It was just, It's just crazy. I, I, I can't even begin to name every single high quality game that released this year because that would take up the entire video, but let's be honest here. You already knew that. While all of these high quality releases are certainly important for the entire industry and it does help that they are a lot of fun, it's also important to realize that there are a lot more games than just the really big ones. There are a ton of hidden gems. And if you thought the big games weren't slowing down for the entire year, well boy, let me tell you, for hidden gems, the more niche titles, the same thing can be said. And if anything, it was a lot more scary because man, there, there, there are so many. I got 25 in this video and I, man, I could really do more if I had the time. So I wanted to take this video and talk about 25 of the hidden gems that I've actually played throughout the entire year, as well as highlight some others, and hopefully lead you down the right path to try out some brand new favorites that you didn't even know you wanted until this very video. There's no rhyme or reason to the placement of the games in this list, we're just gonna kinda go through them as I see fit, although things are a little bit Nintendo heavy, I can't help it if Nintendo Switch has games, so let's start off with a bunch of games that are Nintendo exclusive, and then we'll start talking about everything else. Sound good? Good. When the era of the Switch has come and gone, Bayonetta Origins, Cereza and the Lost Demon will go down as one of the hidden gems on the console easily. I totally understand why this game went under the radar, like it's a Bayonetta game, but it's not really a Bayonetta game, it's got an art style and a combat system that really doesn't align with what Bayonetta is, but with what's here, it's super good, it's super charming, it plays well, you control two characters with an analog stick, it's just really, really charming, kind of reminiscent of a 360 and PS3 era action adventure game. If you're not too hung up on the fact that this is a Bayonetta game, mostly in name only, then definitely give this one a shot. Nintendo really sent WarioWare Move It to die, like right in between Super Mario Bros. Wonder and Super Mario RPG Remake, like of course no one was gonna buy this game, and it's a shame, because I'm one of like the dozen people who bought it, and I can tell you, it's really good. As someone who has loved every WarioWare in the past, and even really enjoyed Get It Together, I can tell you that Move It is one of the best. It's essentially a sequel to the Wii's Smooth Moves, which isn't that what people really liked anyway, so we just get more of that, with better controls thanks to the Joy-Cons. I'm sure some people's mileage will vary on just how accurate the motion controls are, but from my experience, they're all super good, it is super fun, it is just as wacky as you would expect, and maybe it doesn't have as much content as I want, it's like a typical WarioWare game where you do the one playthrough and you have a couple multiplayer modes, but that's about it, so really, multiple reasons as to why this game didn't sell so well, but at some point, you should definitely play Move It. It is still insane to me that Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp even exists in the first place. Like, we saw the reveal trailer, and then everything in the world happened, and it kept getting delayed, and, you know, a lot of people thought it wasn't gonna come out, but still, still finally, by the grace of Miyamoto, it came out. Holy cow. And it's awesome. And it's a shame, because it's probably the last Advance Wars game we're ever gonna get. This series is cursed. I had never played Advance Wars before, it was always a game that was on my backlog, but I just never got around to it. And yeah, after playing this, it's really fun! My primary experience with grid-based combat like this is Fire Emblem, so to go into a game where the strategy is totally different and it's all about just building up your army as much as you possibly can in this one solo map and then just brute forcing your way to the finish line, it took a little bit to retool my way of thinking, but hey, once I figured it out, it was a blast. There are multiplayer and map creation parts of this game, and that's really cool, but not something that's really for me. I was just in it for the two primary adventures, and hell, even just for that, really enjoyed it. It's a hidden gem because of the circumstances surrounding it, and it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, because once again, we're never gonna see this, or Battalion Wars ever again. But hey, it's fun while it lasted, and this game coming back means that hell can indeed freeze over. Let's hope Starfy is next. It's not a full game, but man, it is not getting the respect it deserves. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 DLC Future Redeemed, like, oh my god. I rarely, if ever, talk about Xenoblade, but the reality is I adore this franchise so much. I have been sticking with it since the very beginning on the Wii, and to have this DLC that wraps up the entire plotline that carries all three of the main games together, it was so damn satisfying, and it, it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense how good this is. Xenoblade is always like a really long game, right? So consider this to be basically a full-length normal game, and it's just DLC, with so much fan service with the new characters, and like, there's more I really want to go into, but you really go into spoiler territory with like the entire trilogy beforehand, but trust me, if you have not played this yet, if you either played Xenoblade 3 and haven't played the DLC yet, or you've just not played Xenoblade entirely, it is worth going through the existing trilogy just to get to this moment, because god, it's just, 
it's just so good and like oh the music is fantastic and there were still some plot lines that i wish were a little bit resolved from the main game but hey what's here it's awesome can't wait for the future god xenoblade is it's just so damn good guys okay finally something not by nintendo but it is switch exclusive action rpg silent hope the basic gameplay loop of this adventure is you're constantly jumping down this massive crater and it's a roguelike, so go as far as you possibly can, gather up as much loot as you can, and either make your way back of your own choice, or you die and you get sent back. You handle a bunch of resources to make your next trip better, it's all typical roguelike stuff, but the main hook that kept me really loving this game is there are seven characters to play with and you can switch between them as you progress on your run. Rather than picking one character, which is essentially just a different weapon, and committing to it for an entire run and trying to master that one weapon, you are actually incentivized to balance every single character because you get extra perks for swapping, and it does help that in my opinion, all the characters are fun. The plot is pretty interesting too, with this girl you're trying to free from like this crystal, and it's a silent thing, like all the characters are silent, they don't really talk, they just make the grunts so they don't really talk, like I, I get it, there's a plot, it's a cool aesthetic, it's in the Harvest Moon world I guess, or the Story of Seasons world because the cows are the same, but really I'm only here for the gameplay, and it's really fun, so Silent Hope, thumbs up from me. Disney Illusion Island filled a platformer niche that I've been desperately wanting filled for like ever now. So many platformers have co-op that I feel is forced. If the skill gap between the different players are different, then one person has to slow down, one person has to speed up, even Mario Wonder suffered from this, it often leads to an uneven playing experience. But this game here, Disney Illusion Island, is actually the perfect co-op platformer. If you play it solo, then sure, it's like very slow and it's a metroidvania that's incredibly linear, like you're not gonna get anything mind-blowing out of it, but if you have someone to play this game with, it goes at the perfect pace, the charm is of course overwhelming because it's really great artistic Mickey Mouse stuff, and that's all this game really needed to be. Maybe I'm cynical, and maybe just many platformers with co-op are just not my thing, but you love it, and hey, more power to you, I was never a fan, but here, this is the exception, this game is great, with the context that you have someone to play it with. Single player, yeah, it's, it's probably pretty boring. The newest game from the creators of Danganronpa, we have Master Detective Archives Rain Code, which at the time of this video is Switch exclusive, which is incredibly fascinating. This is a completely original story, but the style from the Danganronpa games is here in full force. It is overly anime as all hell, there's murdering going on all over the place, and you, as this one character, whose last name is Coco Head, which is hilarious, have to go and figure things out. And of course, you have a ghost with you, because of course, and then they can turn into a girl, and you know there's a lot of there's a lot of weird you know rated m undertones with listen okay it's weird it is a weird game you interact with a really endearing cast of characters a lot of the twists are really interesting the combat whenever it happens is is pretty interesting and when you start to figure out just exactly what's going on in this city that is just shrouded with rain at all times definitely a plot twist that only the creators of danganronpa can conjure I think overall it's a less interesting story than any of the individual Danganronpa games before this besides maybe some of the spin-offs, but hey, it's still really fun and recommended if you're okay with it not being a 10 out of 10 experience. As a cool, quirky, Japanese visual novel, fully 3D and interactable, it comes recommended. Dude, Cocoon. This game was ridiculous, man. This is one of those games that's really better the less that you know going into it, so I'll keep what I say very minimal. You play as this little bug dude, and you're carrying orbs around you at all times, and these orbs contain worlds, and you just pop them down, and then, hey, look at that, now you can jump into the world. If, if that didn't sell you already on the game, I, I don't know what will, because this, this game is incredible. The amount of mind-bending puzzles that come from this game, because you are balancing multiple worlds at a single time, the aesthetics, like the visuals are fantastic, the sound design, like, oh my god, this game has some of the best sound design of any video game I've ever played ever, and the ending sequence is so satisfying, and the kicker? You can probably knock this out in a single playthrough if you wanted to, it's only a few hours long. That's perfect. I do, it's so, it's so good. If you like puzzle games and you like what you see, don't even, don't look up anything else. Just, just stay with the knowledge that it's really good and jump on in because man, this game is awesome. And not enough people gave it the recognition that it deserved. Similarly, on the topic of puzzle games, Viewfinder. Uh, I, I don't know what it took to technically make this game possible, but it's insane. I have no idea what the programming had to have been to figure out how you can take this photograph and hold it up in front of you and then you press a button and then it's real life and like it understands perspective and how the distance and what it should be in front of you like I don't I don't understand but it just works so naturally as you would expect having a multi hour long puzzle game with this one core idea it's awesome. It ramps up at a beautiful pace, and there is a story that is trying to be told with these audio logs that you can listen to, and like, it, it's kind of neat, uh, and there's like a cat 
that has like, it's a kind of, kind of transparent, and that's really cute. You can pet it, but I'm here for the puzzles because the puzzles are just awesome. Never once did the core idea of taking a photo, putting it in front of you, and then it becomes reality ever get old once. You may have already played a ton of first person puzzle games out there because man, there are many, but this is easily one of the best. I don't know if this really constitutes being a hidden gem, but I still feel like not enough people talked about it, and maybe I'm just wrong in my gauging of how popular this game was, but I'm gonna still say it's the best Xbox exclusive of the year. If you take away the rhythm element, then it does kind of come off as a very typical beat-em-up, hack-and-slash, platformer hybrid, like I get it, but that rhythm component is not just a mechanic, it is integral to the entire world that this game has built. The art style is incredible, when you're playing everything just pops, the colors are ridiculous, the cutscenes are so well animated, the voice acting is great, and one of the things that I really appreciate is a lot of the soundtrack is original. Having a rhythm game like this, I kind of felt like it was going to be a lot of licensed music, but that's not the case. It does show up, but it is really cool when it does because it's a very small part of the overall package. Because the overall package is just such a fun romp that never lets up, it never disappoints, it's not a single dull moment in the entire game, and before it could even possibly overstay its welcome, it wraps up and in a brilliant way, and I can just hope that there's more of this, because uh, I know I know Microsoft spent a lot of money putting Starfield up as like their big game, but quite frankly, this is the better Xbox exclusive. I don't think that's a hot take, but it is what it is. Dude, I was so blindsided by Pseudo Regalia, it is unreal. If you just take one look at this game, you might not expect a whole lot, you know, hey, it's a platformer with some Metroidvania elements, and it's low poly. Wow! But no. No, 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 no. Okay, it turns out that secretly, the person who was developing this game created one of the most fun characters to ever control in any 3D space ever. And the game is less than $10. And the beautiful thing about this game that's really it. It's a Metroidvania with incredible controls in a 3D space. That's all you need to know. It's awesome. You're sliding, doing these crazy jumps. The wall jump feels so good. You got combat that actually has a good snap to it. And when you hit enemies, it all just feels really powerful. You're getting upgrades all the time. I will say there are a few parts that are a little bit too ambiguous. So I got lost. Maybe that's just because I'm an idiot. I don't know. Once again, the game was less than $6. I can't fault it too much. Some things are definitely gonna have to be ironed out if there were to ever be a sequel, but hey man, what's here? This total surprise of a game that's only a few dollars, that's not on consoles yet, but damn it it should, Pseudo Regalia. Man, the 3D space has been in video games for so long, and now we have one of the best characters to ever play in that 3D space. That's insane. And it's, le it's less than $10, that's nuts! How many people even know that BitTrip Rerunner exists? It's a damn shame this game didn't get marketed more because, like, it's a brand new runner game. That's probably the best one. It has music from every single bit trip game, even the ones that weren't runner. It basically has the entirety of runner one within it. There's a level editor where you can share levels with other people online. There's new mechanics. It doesn't do anything crazy like runner three did. Like, it's a new bit trip runner game. And it's awesome. If you have somehow never played this fantastic seminal rhythm platformer series, then yeah, definitely give this a go. The rest of the games are fine. I actually love the entirety of the main bit trip games and Runner 2 and 3 are kinda cool, but Rerunner, it keeps the basics, it keeps the art style the way it should be with just a ton of content. This is a love letter to the entire franchise. And like Pseudo Regalia, the only problem is it's not on consoles yet, but damn it, if you have a way to play it, you still should. All I had to do was play as the main character in Gravity Circuit for like two seconds to be like, okay, yeah, this game's gonna be really good. There is zero hesitation in my voice when I say that this is the best Mega Man like ever made, and I don't know if it can be topped. This game is so much fun. It is Mega Man in concept because the whole world is filled with robots, you have multiple stages to go through, it's a lot of high action, fantastic soundtrack, but the play control, it's a lot more similar to Mega Man Zero. It's a ton of close combat. You're dashing around, you're punching things, you're kicking things, you're doing these crazy combos and wall jumps all over the place. It is so immensely satisfying. The world Worlds are really big, but don't overstay their welcome. There are collectibles all over the place if you want to save some people. The urge to replay every single level is so strong just to perfect your runs. And hell, the story ain't all that bad either. It's a Mega Man-like, so they really didn't need to worry about it, but what's here is really cool. If you're into modern games with a retro aesthetic that also doesn't have the insanely hard difficulty curves that you would expect from some retro games, then yeah, Gravity Circuit, I would argue you really can't do that much better. I don't know how much this one counts either because it's an old game getting remastered, but 
I still don't think enough people are supporting it because this should sell like 20 million plus copies because, oh my God, Ghost Trick Phantom Detective is so good. This melding of an incredibly interesting story involving a little bit of time travel and just a cool art style and the music is fantastic and the, the cast of characters is so good. Like, I really want to just talk about every minute detail of this game, but it's a story-based game. You're going to quickly go into spoilers, but just know you play as this dude. His hair is really cool. A lot of people around him just like die a whole lot and you can go and prevent their death. And you got to keep doing that because you have to solve the mystery of how you died and you have a limited time to do so because once the sun rises, you are gone for good. Just, I swear to God, just, just go on whatever console you want, play the demo. I'm tired of telling people that cause not like how many times do I have to say this is an 11 out of 10 game. Okay. Go Ghost Trick is so good, just buy it, okay? Just buy it and play it and comment about how good it is. Tell everyone to buy it. You'll thank me later. Maybe it's because it came out too early in the year, but I'm surprised not more people were talking about SpongeBob SquarePants The Cosmic Shake. Perhaps it's just the sad reality of not enough people really caring about the PS2 style of 3D platformer, but man, that is my bread and butter, and just having a modern game that really is just coded as a PS2 platformer. I love it. I know I have this weird SpongeBob bias because I've played like every single video game there is, but I'm telling you, this game is great. This is almost like a dream game that so many people thought would never happen. A full-fledged sequel to Battle for Bikini Bottom that goes all out. The themes are incredibly varied, the art style is fantastic, the variety is perfect, the story is wacky and sure, the multiverse thing, a little bit played out, but still really fun in the SpongeBob universe. And it had every opportunity to just be this really corny, childish game that nobody would really enjoy unless you're five years old, but I'm telling you, if you enjoy that PS2 era of platformers as much as I do, then you owe it to yourself to add the Cosmic Shake to your playlist. I just hope that this means that like it doesn't take another 10 to 15 years to get another SpongeBob game that's quality. I'm I'm begging you, just just enjoy this while I can, because it's not gonna be here for very long. Over the last few years, man, Square Enix has been dropping so many quality games, it is impossible to keep track of all of them, but Theater Rhythm, or Theater Rhythm, I don't know, that's weird, I say Theater Rhythm, is simply put, a fantastic rhythm game with so much content in it and so many songs, it's mind-boggling. I was never really a Final Fantasy guy, so I don't have that nostalgic tie to this game that I'm sure a lot of other people would have, but it's hard to deny just how great a ton of this franchise's music is. And for me, the bonus on top of all of this is the DLC, which has extra music for games that I actually do care about, like The World Ends With You, and Live Alive, and Near Automata. Like yeah, okay, the main game has a ton of songs, you Final Fantasy fans are gonna just be up to your necks in great content, but for me, I did opt to spend a little bit of extra money because I couldn't help myself. Uh, Megalomania from Live Alive is in the game now because I spent a few extra dollars, and I'm so happy about that because that song slaps. And I just want more people to buy this game because that increases the chances of making a new Theater Rhythm Dragon Quest game and maybe this time it would release outside of Japan and uh, that would be really cool. So, fingers crossed, that's my master plan all along. But now, here's a rhythm game that just that touches me in the soul, okay? Rhythm Doctor. This isn't a new game, this game has been around for quite a long time, like even before the early access on Steam. This has been a browser game, like for God knows how long. But in 2023, there was a brand new DLC chapter, and I just wanna take this chance to plug the entire game because it's amazing. It is a single button rhythm game. Like every single mechanic of this game is done with a single button, either tapping it, tapping it multiple times, holding it, very Rhythm Heaven-esque. But where the beauty and that simplicity comes from is the aesthetics surrounding the song. The world of this game takes place in a hospital and the surrounding areas. And by putting themselves in that world, they were able to do so much when it comes to storytelling. It's no exaggeration when I say that some of the levels in this game do some things that I have never seen before in like any video game ever that are going to be sticking with me for the rest of my life. And the people who have played this game know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's worth talking about here because the brand new Act 5 is arguably the best act in the entire game. They went so extra with this act. It is nuts, it is insane, it is so good, the music is fantastic, the final stage is, is jaw-dropping. Just play Rhythm Doctor, okay? It's an incredible game. It's probably on sale all the time because it's on Steam. Just play it, okay? Just play it and thank me later. Dude, I can't believe how much I enjoyed Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2. Like, it, it's not a meme, okay? Like, I know, I played a lot of SpongeBob games, and hey, Nickelodeon comes out with a new game, and wow, it's not terrible, that's crazy. But no, man, 
I've brought this up at parties, okay? I have played this game with so many people and I've had an absolute blast. This game just feels really fun. I really feel like this is one of the best Smash likes you could possibly find. And the attention to detail with every single character, the single player being a roguelike, that's genius. I know there's DLC coming down the line with more characters and whatnot, and I really hope support for this game continues in the future, even if we have to get Nick All-Star Brawl 3 that perfects things even more so. But after the first game, which I felt was just not good at at all, they really hit their stride with the second one, and I'm telling you man, I know it's a Nickelodeon game, and you may not expect it, but if you like Smash Brothers at all, I'm telling you, Nick All-Star Brawl 2 slaps. So I didn't really play a ton of my PS5 in 2023, and I was almost gonna pass humanity up because this console was already kind of collecting dust on my shelf, but I'm really glad that's not the case, because Man, Humanity is like a throwback to this weird era of PS1 puzzle game like Intelligent Cube that I've been missing for so long and I love it. Currently, this is PlayStation exclusive and I'm actually kind of happy about that because this really feels like that type of game that I've been missing from PlayStation for so long. So you play as like this dog god, right? And then there's this whole string of people that are just walking around aimlessly and kind of like Choo Choo Rocket, you can place these things down to guide them into the direction that you want. And with this, you get to just solve a ton of puzzles. You can do some swimming, you can jump into the people if you wanna if you wanna be one with them because why not? Every level just takes place in the sky because of course it does. Part of me enjoys this game because it's just an ingenious puzzle game, but another part of me really just loves the fact that this feels like a spiritual successor to a PS1 hidden gem that you haven't heard of that only released in Japan. Like it just has that vibe, okay? So if you really like that vibe, then humanity is definitely worth a shot. Hey, look at that, another puzzle game. Just a great year for puzzle games all around. Just for really weird ones, man, because like Patrick's Parabox, this is another one where the programming must have been insane. On the surface, it looks like a very typical block pusher, but you just look at it for more than five seconds, you can tell that there was a lot more than that. For a lot of these squares, not only can you push them, you can go inside of them. You can push other blocks inside of them, you can go inside of other blocks that are inside other blocks, and it's like this weird infinite recursion of blocks, and it really changes your perception of what is possible with a basic block pusher like this. I haven't been this stumped with a very simple on the surface puzzle game since Baba Is You, which is one of my favorite puzzle games of all time. Not to take anything away from the previous puzzle games I mentioned in this video with Cocoon and Humanity because those games obviously have their strengths, but when it comes to just having a pure mind bender of a puzzle game, Patrick's Parabox takes the cake. All right, here we go. Something with a little bit more of an edge. Octopath Traveler 2. Dude. I'm not really a fan of the first Octopath. I feel like there are just a ton of parts about that adventure that feel half-baked. And man, they obviously took that to heart because not only are the following games in the HD 2D series with Triangle Strategy and Live Alive fantastic, Octopath 2, honestly, is one of the best RPGs I've ever played. It's the same basic idea where you have these eight characters that are going on their own adventures on the same map and they can sometimes interact with each other. But the stories for each of these individual characters are phenomenal. There are some times where they do interact either with these basic conversation scenes or these more fleshed out multi-chapter segments where two characters will pair up to do a little bit of a side story and those are really fun. Traversal is a lot more fun because these characters have field effects that they can activate on the overworld now. Battling is a lot more fun and satisfying because you can also double the speed of it. I love that. And the soundtrack, like, oh, oh my god, this soundtrack, it's insane how good it is. The boss track for all of these characters too, like, oh my god, it's one of the best boss themes I've ever heard. And each character has a unique opening to that battle theme, and oh man, every time the battle theme kicks in, it just, oh, it fills my adrenaline. Dude, it's so, it's so good. And the final boss? Dude. Oh my god, this game is insane. You do not need to play the first Octopath to get the full enjoyment out of this game. There are still some things I would like to see if a third game were to ever come out, but I have a sneaking suspicion that give it some time, Octopath 2 will start entering more and more people's conversations in the same vein as Chrono Trigger as being one of the best RPGs of all time. I don't care if it's a sprite-based game and it's not using the same amount of power that Final Fantasy 16 is using, I don't care. This game... God, this game is a masterpiece. It was such a shame to me that not enough people played the first Ghost Runner game, like barely anybody was talking about it. So color me really surprised that we got a sequel to it and it's so much better. And God, man, I love Ghost Runner so much. Imagine like a modern Doom game, right? Like this first person, high adrenaline, a lot of areas where there's combat. Like imagine that style of game, but you play as a ninja and there's platforming like Mirror's Edge and it's in a cyberpunk world. So the story is really cool. The aesthetics are really cool. The soundtrack is fantastic. You have a grappling hook. 
Dude, grappling hooks need to be in more games. And if you just want a game that feels good to play and every single slasher of your blade is satisfying, then yeah man, Ghost Runner has your back. In terms of being a sequel, it is kind of just more or less the same. There are some tweaks to like how you activate some certain specials and whatnot and equipables, like that stuff is different, but for the most part, it is more of the same with some new mechanics like grinding. <laughs> sure, I'm okay with that. But quite frankly, after playing the first game, that's all I wanted anyway. Also interesting coming from me, someone who typically prefers playing games on consoles with controllers, this is a game that I need to play with a mouse and keyboard. I don't think I've ever played a single game that I needed a mouse and keyboard to really get the full enjoyment out of, but this game was the one for me. I was even fine playing Doom with a controller. But man, jumping around here and slashing the sword and slowing down time and needing to get all my shots precise. God, man, we, oh man, man, I love Ghost Runner so much. I'm really glad I waited this long to do my Hidden Gems video because otherwise I would have missed out on talking about Undertale Yellow. Because wow. This fan game that is completely free has been in development for like 8 years and somehow I had zero idea of its existence until it released. I don't think it's much of a hidden gem, like I'm sure most Undertale fans know about it now, so it's by no means really a hidden gem, but because it released so late in the year, it's already going to get overshadowed by games that are going to release in January of 2024, so hey, this is one of the best games of the year. Undertale Yellow blew me away, and it's nuts that it's free because it should cost money, because it should be canon. Similar to the base Undertale, this is an experience best of going in by knowing very little, but what I will tell you is that it's amazing just how high quality this is. I'm aware there is quite a substantial Undertale fan game scene out there, but no fan game comes close to the dedication to making a story filled with characters and brand new mechanics so well fleshed out and also having them make sense to the canon that the base Undertale game established. Like you could really tell me that this game is a genuine prequel to Undertale and it's an official thing and I would believe you because it really deserves it. It's a full length adventure that's like 6 to 8 hours long but there are also multiple pathways you get to do the pacifist run, a neutral run, a genocide run, there's even a fourth ending that's also really good. There is so much more Undertale Yellow content that goes into all of the finer details of what this package offers, but man, it really should be celebrated how good this is. This goes down easily as one of the best fan games for any franchise ever, and it is easy to see why this took 8 years to develop. And considering it's clearly going to take quite a while for Deltarune to be fully completed, I'm going to take as much content as I possibly can. Undertale Yellow, absolute gem. It made all the sense in the world after the first game got remade, but man, We Love Katamari Reroll plus Royal Reverie is exactly the game I wanted it to be, and I feel like it just kinda came and went. That's the result of there being far too many games in a single year, I guess. I played the original back in the day and loved it. Like, I really loved the first Katamari Damacy, but the sequel just adds so many different gimmicks and quirks that I'm sure some people who are more purists for Katamari prefer the more simplistic nature of just every level being about getting bigger in a different environment, like that's every single level. But here, you gotta collect flowers, there are sometimes levels where you have to avoid things, and there's some levels where you gotta get fire, and there's a whole level that's made out of candy, like there's just a whole lot more gimmicks to it and it just keeps the variety a lot stronger. And in my opinion, this ends up being the better game of the two. Plus, a big downside of the first game's remake is you couldn't play as any of the other cousins. That was disappointing. I love collecting these little guys and then being able to play as them, even though all it changes is just a little guy in the corner. That's very important for Katamari, okay? The Royal Reverie stuff is kind of whatever, so in terms of new content, eh, I could take it or leave it. You get to play as the king when he was a child and, like, it's really cute that you can do that, but it's really short and doesn't leave much of an impact. You don't really unlock much of anything substantial from it, it's just a little more content you can do. But it doesn't really change the fact that it's another Katamari game, so by proxy, it's a ton of fun, and now I just wonder what we do in the future, because there are more Katamari games that they could remake, but I'm dying for a new one, man. We got two great remakes, uh, they tried the word Reverie with Klonoa, I had never heard of that word before Klonoa, and now we got two Namco games with the word Reverie in it. So, we're learning a lot today, I'm just saying, play more Katamari. Now before we wrap this up and get to the 25th game on this list, I want to talk about some honorable mentions. There are so many games that released in 2023, like it is absolutely insane how many quality releases there were. I'm lucky enough to say that I've played the 25 games on this list, but there are 20 more games that I really want to play, have not gotten around to yet, but have the full intention of doing so because people say they're all really great. So let's talk about them all while we can. 
Dordonia looks very charming. There's that Switch Goemon game that I don't even know how you say it in English because it was Japanese exclusive and that's very annoying, but hey, the game looks really good. Savant Ascent looks badass. The same can be said for Gumbrella. You have a gun that's also an umbrella, that's amazing. Dredge is a game that I've heard so many things about and I'm excited to one day see why there's so much excitement. Samba de Amigo came back, that's awesome. The quality may not be as high as we would expect, but hey, he's back. Sanabi is one of those indie games that some people said is good, so it's on my wish list. Sure. Rhapsody The Moral Kingdom Chronicles looks like this really charming combo pack of old RPGs that are getting localized for the very first time. Sure, that's really cool. Orbo's Odyssey? All I know is that the movement looks absolutely insane. I bought it, can't wait to play it. Cassette Beast is supposed to be this really quality Pokemon-like, excited for that. Tiny Sticker Tail looked really charming. Born of Bread looks like a really high quality Paper Mario-like. Little Goody Two Shoes, I'm not sure if this is gonna be my thing, but the people who say that this is their thing say this is high quality, so I'm gonna give it a shot. Same thing goes for Paranorma Site. Square Enix put this out. What? Cobalt Core looks like this really cute and engaging ship management game. Chance of Sonar, I really know nothing about. Apparently people say it's like a language deduction game about figuring out what this new language is all about. Like, sure, okay. Looks cool, I'll give it a shot. The Many Pieces of Mr. Koo. All I know about this is the art style is incredible. I wanna play for that alone. Lunar Lux is this really high quality, almost with like a Game Boy Advance aesthetic RPG in space. I love that. Worth bringing up the fact that Rayman came back in the final piece of Mario and Rabbit Sparks of Hope DLC. That's awesome, and I'm upset I haven't played it yet. And lastly, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. I don't really think it's a hidden gem, um, but I do know that I can tell that not enough people are talking about it because the people who have played it are saying incredible things, and it just, it's just not as loud as I feel like it should be, so... I'm gonna put in my two cents and eventually figure out if it was worth it or not. But yeah, man, when you really sit down and take a look at the entire year that we just dealt with with all these video games that were coming out, it is easily one of the best video game years of all time. Because you throw in all of the high quality stuff on top of this, it was hard to play anything else that didn't release this year. My backlog is big enough as it is. But if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Let me know down in the comments below if any of these games are entering your wish list or your two playlist in the near future. But with that, here is the final game on my list of hidden gems for games that I've actually played some of from 2023. The Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection. It is a budget collection of six full-length Game Boy Advance RPGs. That's all I really need to say. The value kind of speaks for itself. I'm not even halfway done with all six of these games yet. Like, it's gonna take a while, but listen. It's six big Game Boy Advance games in one package. It's awesome. Okay, bye. Thanks for watching.